Thank you very much for coming and being at PurpleCon and sticking out the whole day. And welcome to Devs Against the Dark Arts. Today's curriculum is an introductory class into getting to the mindset of Lord Voldemort so that we can write better web applications, which is a topic that I think that we can all agree makes complete sense. Anyway, I'm Atticus. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Atticus underscore AU. I'm a penetration tester from Melbourne. I work for Assurance, who were kind enough to help me get here today. I'm also someone who enjoys a good analogy. As a former historian, I've spoken about software and tech-related topics and concepts by telling stories about things like undersea telegraph cables and horror movies from the 1920s, and stage magic and poison. But today, I'm going to use the story of Harry Potter to talk about web application security, because it seemed like a fun thing to do, and I like a good excuse to wear robes on stage. It's a pen tester's job to think as malicious internet users do. Talks on how security vulnerabilities work and how to mitigate them can often pack in a lot of technical detail, but understanding security concepts doesn't have to start there. It doesn't even have to be about software. Um, we can learn a lot about basic app security, lots of app security, by imagining that we're fighting evil wizards because the core concepts are almost exactly the same. We're going to look at this by analyzing how Professor Albus Dumbledore, the headmaster of Hogwarts School, was and you know, widely recognized as pretty good at magic, thought about and constructed defenses around various important objects and places in the books. Then we'll look at how Lord Voldemort, aka the bad guy, approaches his own security. We'll examine the difference between the two wizards' uh, security practices and then see what we can learn from them both when it comes to web app security. If you're not familiar with the Harry Potter books, then I will do my best to explain things as I go along. But you are also welcome to step out of this talk and go and read the books and come back to this recording later if you would like. Please be warned that this talk will contain spoilers for all of the books. I've chosen <clears throat> three, three security case studies for us to look at in order to pick apart Dumbledore's defense methods. And these are the guarding of the Philosopher's Stone in the book Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, the security mechanisms around the Goblet of Fire in the book Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, and the defenses around the house located at number 12, Grimmauld Place, London, in the fifth to the seventh books of the series. So let's start with an analysis of how the Philosopher's Stone was defended. The Philosopher's Stone is a shiny stone with magic powers that the good guys have and Lord Voldemort wants the stone because it will help him to kick his evil goals. Dumbledore is tasked with protecting the stone from Voldemort because he is very good at magic. He decides to do this by getting a bunch of his staff members to set up a series of seven defenses in front of the stone in sequential chambers hidden behind a classroom door in a third floor corridor at Hogwarts. The seven defenses are, in the order that they're encountered by anyone trying to reach the stone, a three-headed dog, guarding a trapdoor, a murderous plant called the Devil's Snare, a room full of flying keys, a giant enchanted chessboard, a literal troll, a table with seven poisons or potions and a logic puzzle on it, and a magical mirror called the Mirror of Erised. So by layering a bunch of different defenses on top of one another to protect a sensitive content, in this case, the stone, Dumbledore's using the strategy of defense in depth, which we've spoken about at length today. Um, you know, they've got multi-layered strategies working together, protecting sensitive information. Defense in depth is an established security pattern, but how well was this pattern implemented when it came to protecting the Philosopher's Stone? Firstly, a few of these defenses are things that are broadly classed as physical defenses. And these are the three-headed dog, the devil's snare plant, and the troll. They act just like locked doors and giant walls with spikes on top. They're meant to put off opportunistic attacks and to buy the defenders some time. However, they're also supposed to be difficult to penetrate. This is not the case for any of the defenses that are used here, which all have widely known vulnerabilities and bypasses. The three-headed dog is fierce and scary, but it also goes to sleep whenever it hears music. This is common knowledge, because the dog's owner, Hagrid, has terrible OPSEC. 
and told pretty much everybody. The devil's snare is a plant that will bind you tightly to stop you from going anywhere, but it also recoils in the presence of light, which is a common fact that you can read in wizard textbooks for 11-year-olds. <laughs> so if you bring a zippo or a wand with you, you're pretty set. The troll, the troll is a troll. It doesn't bathe, it isn't very intelligent, and it probably says hurtful things on the internet. <laughs> it's vulnerable to becoming unconscious if it's hit on the head really hard. Also, if it's knocked out, the troll doesn't reset itself or get replaced with a fresh troll. So if when Voldemort and his henchmen knock it out, Harry, Ron, and Hermione come along afterwards and they find it and it's still knocked out so they can just walk around it. So your defenses should not be one use only, especially if there's nothing else reinforcing them at the same time. Finally, before you even get to this set of chambers full of allegedly dark wizard-grade magical defenses, the whole thing is protected by a wooden door in a frequently used corridor, and it opens with a very basic unlocking spell, which they also teach in class to 11-year-old wizards. <laughs> it's so simple that our protagonists accidentally end up in this room once. Accidentally. You don't want to implement defenses that can be breached because an 11-year-old panicked. Also, the books are filled with portraits that enforce magical passwords. Why one of those wasn't used here is completely beyond me. <laughs> Next, we run into another common pattern that's designed to stop attackers by being just annoying enough that most people will give up and go away. This is done by treating sensitive information like a needle in a haystack, also known as security through obscurity. The info is right there, but it'll take patience to go through everything and find it. You see this kind of thing a lot on the web, where apps will make sensitive documents or endpoints public, and they give them weird names and hope that nobody will spend the time to try lots of different combinations to find them. This is a commonly used method for hiding sensitive information because it's quick and it's easy to implement. But it's also not a very strong defense, and it has some easy bypasses, as you're about to hear. We can see this pattern used in the case of the room full of flying keys, and also in the case of the final defense, the mirror of Erised. Harry, Ron, and Hermione are able to access the flying key that opens the door to the next chamber by spotting it amongst the other keys, and then using a broomstick to fly up and grab it. And because the room contains multiple broomsticks, it allows for multiple threads of attack to run at the same time, because more than one person could be in the air looking for the key at any given point. There's no rate limiting in place here at all. In fact, multiple su simultaneous attacks are explicitly supported because the room has a bunch of extra broomsticks just lying around. As a defender, this does not make much sense. It's the same thing with the mirror of Erised. The mirror contains the Philosopher's Stone, but it will only release the stone to somebody who wants to find it but not use its powers. Voldemort and his henchmen can't get the stone out of the mirror because they want to use it. But Harry can get the stone out of the mirror because all he wants is to find it in order to stop Voldemort. Ironically, Harry would have achieved his goal much more easily if he hadn't gone after the stone in the first place because it was his presence in the room that allowed the stone to be released from the mirror. Once it was out, the bad guys tried to grab it from him. It was only Dumbledore turning up at the last minute to, to fight them off that stopped this from happening, like some kind of admin SSHing into prod to do a live patch. <laughs> Likewise, there didn't appear to be any rate limiting on this mirror. Theoretically, Voldemort could have grabbed the mirror, taken it out of the chambers, and then set it up and had a whole bunch of people look into it until one of them fulfilled its conditions. That is, they wanted to find the stone, but not use it. And then he could have hit them, head, hit them over the head with a brick and then stolen the stone. Our last type of defense in front of the Philosopher's Stone is what amounts to a couple of capture tests. So capture stands for a completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. It usually looks like a bunch of warped text, or more recently, it gets you to train self-driving cars. <laughs> and it's supposed to be a task that only an attentive human would be able to complete in order to stop a bot or a script from using the feature that it's protecting. These capture-style defenses are the enchanted chess game and the logic puzzle with the potions. The enchanted chess game is it's just a game of chess. 
except all the chess pieces are animate and they will knock you out if you're standing in place of the piece that gets taken. Knowledge of how to play chess isn't secret. It's just a task that takes time and concentration to complete. This slows you down a little bit, but it doesn't guarantee that you'll be stopped from getting to the other side. In the same way, the logic puzzle with the seven potions isn't something that can be brute forced easily. First, you have to solve the logic puzzle to determine the contents of each of the bottles of the potions. You get one chance to drink the potion out of the lineup that will allow you to either go forward to the next chamber or move back to the previous one, so you need to make sure that you've made the right choice. And if you're thinking that you could just drink them all and YOLO your way out of there, one of the bottles contains a poison that will kill you. So it's not a good strategy. And this task, like the chess game, is designed to make sure that the person, who th that the person who's trying it thinks about it. But it isn't designed to be all that difficult. Both of these things are also designed to take time. You can't just run through the room to the next thing. You're forced to stop and to engage on an intellectual level with what's going on. If you implement a defense that takes time to bypass, you give yourself more time to respond to an attacker. On the other hand, these defenses aren't all that difficult to bypass. All the information needed to get past them is either common knowledge in the case of how to play chess or right there in front of you in the case of the logic puzzle. And much like real captures, these things are incredibly annoying, especially when you have to deal with them on your way in and you're a legitimate user. The main point of employing defense in depth is to buy you time to respond to an attack if you're a defender. The main downfall of all of the above mechanisms is that you can't buy time to respond to an attack if you don't even know that the attack is happening, which is exactly the case with the Philosopher's Stone. There is no useful logging or monitoring or alerting going on here at all. None. No ghosts are running through the halls screaming that someone's broken into the third floor corridor. There are no owls showing up to deliver messages to the wizards who were on call. The ridiculous thing about this is that we know that the wizarding world has access to spooky levels of monitoring and alerting because anytime an underage wizard does magic outside of Hogwarts, they get an owl with a letter about it almost immediately, like down to the timestamp and the name of the spell that was performed. This happens to Harry Potter at the start of the Chamber of Secrets, at the start of the Prisoner of Azkaban, and also at the start of the Order of the Phoenix. They use this a lot. And later in the books, Voldemort also gets alerts every time somebody says his name, which I, I'm guessing is where Google Alerts got the idea. <laughs> for Dumbledore, not to have implemented anything like this for the Philosopher's Stone is a serious oversight. Just because he turned up right at the end to save Harry from being killed by Lord Voldemort, it doesn't make him a hero. It makes him kind of a negligent ops engineer. <laughs> Dumbledore should have been waiting for Voldemort before he even got past the first room. Not to mention that because of his design, he had to fight past all of his own defenses the exact same way in order to get to the stone, just like any old attacker, which doesn't seem like the most efficient way to do things. So, scorecard for defenses on the Philosopher's Stone, maybe a four out of 10? Okay attempt at using defense in depth, but uses multiple known vulnerable defenses and is severely let down by lack of monitoring and alerting. All right, let's move on to look at the Goblet of Fire. The Goblet of Fire is a magical cup which has the job of deciding which students will compete in the Triwizard Tournament, which is an inter-school magical competition. And it appears in the fourth book, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Students can write their name on a slip of paper that goes into the goblet and submissions are open for 24 hours. And then there's a ceremony will, where the cup will return the names of one candidate per school who are then bound to compete in the Triwizard Tournament. It was decided that the only students who could compete in the Triwizard Tournament during the course of Harry Potter's fourth year at Hogwarts should be aged 17 and over because the competition was so dangerous. The only other rule for the selection of candidates for the goblet was that there should be only one candidate chosen per school. Traditionally, three schools compete in the Triwizard Tournament, hence the name. The plot of the Goblet of Fire revolves around the fact that 14-year-old Harry Potter is mysteriously chosen to be the fourth Triwizard Champion. How this happened when Harry was under the age of 17 and a champion from his school had already been selected is revealed at the end of the story, and I'll dig into the vulnerabilities exploited there in just a second. But firstly, let's have a look at the Goblet's configuration and security settings. 
we aren't given much information about how the goblet makes its decisions about the Triwizard candidates, but we do know that Dumbledore put one defense mechanism in place around the goblet, an age line. This was supposed to stop anybody under the age of 17 from entering this base and putting the paper with their name into the goblet. The age line is a literal line on the ground that can only be crossed by people aged 17 and over. Otherwise, there's nothing to stop anyone approaching the goblet, which is left unguarded for 24 hours in the middle of the Great Hall at Hogwarts. Dumbledore said he did this to ensure that no underage student yields to temptation. But people try to bypass the control mechanism pretty much immediately. In the 24 hours that it's open, we learned that four students try to trick the age line by taking an aging potion to make themselves a few months older. This doesn't work. The spell throws them out of the ring immediately. A successful age line bypass is made on behalf of Lord Voldemort by Barty Crouch Jr. in disguise as Mad-Eye Moody. There are plot reasons for this. He's one of the Hogwarts teachers. He enters Harry Potter's name into the goblet and is successful in having Harry chosen as the fourth Triwizard Champion, which is part of Voldemort's evil plan. Crouch circumvents the protections around the goblet in two ways. Firstly, he is over the age of 17. There's nothing in the books to say that a person over the age of 17 couldn't enter someone else's name into the goblet. It's not clear if any other students added this, tried this, but if they did, they weren't chosen, so we don't know about it. Going on what we do know about Crouch's hack, the age line only checked if the person crossing it was over the age of 17. It didn't check if that person was adding their own name to the goblet or somebody else's. The authorization of app requests is important, especially when those requests are making changes to a database. <laughs> the goblet didn't have any kind of authentication or authorization protections whatsoever, which is a serious oversight. Secondly, Crouch uses a confundus charm on the goblet to trick it into thinking that there's a fourth competing school in the competition and that Harry Potter belongs to the school. Because Harry Potter is the only candidate for the fourth school, he's chosen to compete in the Trivers of Tournament. There don't appear to be any data injection defenses on the Goblet of Fire at all either, or if they are, they're not very strong ones. If the Goblet had validated the names of the schools that were submitted against its own known list of schools, it may have been more likely to reject the presence of a fourth school, and then Harry wouldn't have been guaranteed to be chosen. Also, the data that was entered into the Goblet should have been sanitized before it was added, and then again for bad data before the final vote was run. This could include stripping out data with the names of bogus schools, as well as matching and removing names that corresponded to students that were under the age of 17. The long and short of this is that you should never trust user input into your app <laughs> or your goblet. Your user might be legit, or they could be submitting post requests on behalf of Lord Voldemort. <laughs> Scorecard for the defenses on the goblet of fire, two out of 10. The age line worked well against some basic attacks, but Without authorization and authentication, and without validating user input, it was vulnerable to data injection and the plots of evil wizards. For our last case study, we will examine the protections that Dumbledore placed around number 12, Grimmauld Place, in London. This addresses the house of Harry Potter's godfather, Sirius Black, and for a few years, it acted as the headquarters of the anti-Voldemort activist group, the Order of the Phoenix. Because of its status as Order HQ, the house became a target for dark wizards. And lots of prominent members of the Order, including Dumbledore and Severus Snape and Harry Potter, were known to spend time there. This made it pretty important to defend properly, so the Order looked to its leader, Dumbledore, to harden the configuration of the house as much as possible. The main defense that Number 12 had going for it was the Fidelius charm. In the words of one of the Hogwarts teachers, the Fidelius charm is an immensely complex spell involving the magical concealment of a secret inside a single living soul. The information is hidden inside the chosen person, or secret keeper, and is henceforth impossible to find, unless, of course, the secret keeper chooses to divulge it. The secret in this case was the location of the headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix. Dumbledore was the secret keeper for this particular spell, which effectively meant that he was the only one who could tell someone where the headquarters was. Once someone else knew about it, they were unable to pass that knowledge on, even if they were tortured or coerced. The main problem with the Fidelius charm is that it has a single point of failure, and that's the secret keeper. That person has to be the one to tell everybody who needs to know the secret. However, 
Harry Potter learns about number 12 Grimald Place because Dumbledore writes the secret down on a piece of paper, hands it to someone else, who then passes it to Harry. This is an extremely insecure method of transport. <laughs> this note could have been accidentally dropped and read by anyone. It was totally in plain text. The information that it had on it was only kept secure because after Harry reads it, the note's set on fire by the person who gives it to him. If they hadn't done that, presumably the note could have been handed around any number of people and the secret would have been shared multiple times. Dumbledore clearly had not heard about transport encryption. <laughs> the other problem with the secret keeper method of keeping number 12 safe is that when the secret keeper dies, anybody who was told the secret automatically becomes the secret keeper themselves. The Order of the Phoenix runs into this problem after Dumbledore dies. In Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, the protagonists explicitly have to deal with the fallout from this. Mr. Weasley had explained that after the death of Dumbledore, their secret keeper, each of the people to whom Dumbledore had confided Grimmauld Place's location had become a secret keeper in turn. And as there are around 20 of us, that greatly dilutes the power of the Fidelius charm. <sighs> this is not entirely unlike someone quitting their job and checking their AWS keys into Git at 5 p.m. on their last day. Shared keys are weak keys because the more people who know the secret and the more machines that store it, the more likely it is that someone's going to obtain the secret and use it to mess up your whole operation. In the worst case, if this happened to a software key, we could revoke the original key and then rotate it to a new value. However, the Fidelius charm doesn't appear to have the concept of key rotation, so there's no way to undo the secret keeper spell either, unless everyone who knows it dies or the place it applies to, like a house, gets knocked down. This is pretty much the equivalent of getting hacked and throwing your hands up and buying a new domain name and starting over. <laughs> also, we learn through the course of the books that Dumbledore strongly suspected that he was going to die soon. And knowing this, he still set himself up as a single point of failure for the headquarters of the anti-Voldemort League. This is a jerk move. <laughs> no points to Gryffindor. If you know you're going to leave a project and you're a decent person, you don't make everything depend on your keys and then just weaken them all with no alternatives, no backups. You do handovers. You plan for disaster recovery scenarios. And if you're actually actively at war with literally Lord Voldemort, you don't just leave everyone to scramble and find a new secret headquarters if you die, unless you're a jerk. Yeah, I'm calling Dumbledore a jerk. <laughs> I give this defense <laughs> zero out of 10. No disaster recovery options, and secrets can only be transmitted insecurely. Keys can't be revoked. So if Dumbledore, thinking like a good wizard, was unable to get into the mindset of a dark wizard, then how do they think? And how does that help us do better? Well, let's compare the previous case studies to Voldemort's security model. Before the start of the Harry Potter books, even before his Death Eater startup had really gotten off the ground, Voldemort decided that he needed to make backups so that he could recover himself if something bad happened, and so he could survive attempts by other wizards to knock him offline. <laughs> he did this by creating Horcruxes. Here's how one Hogwarts professor describes Horcruxes. Well, you split your soul, you see, and hide part of it in an object outside the body then even if one's body is attacked or destroyed, one cannot die, for part of the soul remains earthbound and undamaged. Voldemort decided to create seven Horcruxes because he knew that if someone tried to murder him and knock one of his availability zones offline, he could just fail over to any of the other ones <laughs> while he resolved the incident. He also decided that these Horcruxes needed to be stored in geographically different places so that it would be more difficult to take them all out at once. So he went to a lot of effort to ensure that they were placed safely out of the way in a wide range of locations. The main weakness in the Horcrux method, which was the thing that was ultimately used to destroy Voldemort in the end, is that he used personally relevant information when he created them. He chose artifacts that were significant to him and could be identified with some strategic intelligence gathering. So this meant that Dumbledore was able to deduce the existence of Horcruxes and what they were likely to be and pass that information on to Harry so that he could carry on destroying them. The other problem with Voldemort's system was that despite having mastered the art of monitoring and alerting in his day-to-day -day operations, he had no alerting on the status of the Horcrux infrastructure, which, again, 
oversight. He set up lots of defenses around the Horcruxes and then just assumed that they would defend themselves, which is not great security posture. The lack of monitoring and alerting meant that it was easy for Harry and Dumbledore to systematically hunt all of the Horcruxes down and then destroy them without Voldemort noticing, even though he had alerts going on for all kinds of other important things. But overall, the Horcrux plan worked really well. It took a team of dedicated opponents a lot of time and effort to find them and destroy them all. And ultimately, the time that Voldemort spent drawing up a disaster recovery plan, creating backups, and segregating storage meant that he managed to keep the bare minimum alive and running for 14 years after the massive outage he experienced when he tried to kill baby Harry. And eventually, he was able to restore fully from backup at the end of the Goblet of Fire. My scorecard, seven and a half points out of 10. Good use of disaster recovery, redundancy planning and infrastructure segregation. Monitoring and alerting need work and personal details shouldn't be used as keys to secure important information. So, why is Voldemort more thorough at planning defenses than Dumbledore? In the end, Harry Potter and the good guys end up winning against him, but the cost is huge. The losses are great. And part of why this happens is because Voldemort and his followers are driven by extremely different motivations, and they have different standards of right and wrong than most wizards do. Dumbledore generally just wants to eat sherbet lemons and hang out with his pet phoenix and help young witches and wizards be their best selves. <laughs> Voldemort wants to start a race war and literally take over the world. He's got goals that most wizards quite reasonably don't. So he's going to consider use cases and methods that most wizards wouldn't in order to get that stuff done. Whoop. With regard to attacking things, Voldemort tries all kinds of weird, out-of-the-box, often unethical methods for achieving his ends. If you're a wizard who generally wants to do good and make other people happy, getting into the frame of mind of someone who once tried to literally murder a baby in cold blood is going to be kind of hard. But it is worth that mental exercise if you want to plan defenses against the kinds of strange and disturbing things that an opponent might actually try to do to get the information that you have, and if you want to understand the things that motivate them. The other reason that Dumbledore's defenses are more thorough than Dumbledore, uh, that Voldemort's defenses, sorry, are more thorough than Dumbledore's is because Voldemort's a paranoid person who trusts nobody and has no friends. <laughs> he knows most people are against his plans and that the only person that he's going to help is himself, which is why he starts thinking about making Horcruxes while he's still at school. Conversely, Dumbledore leans more towards creating groups of confidants, building teams, and trusting others with important tasks. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to do any of these things. I think that the best places that I've ever worked really have been in strong teams that trust each other to do the right thing and give each other mutual support. But for your app's outward-facing defenses, you'll develop very strong ones if you, can, if you think that everybody's out to get you. You plan even better defenses if you can think of the types of groups that might be out to get you and what might motivate them to try and attack you. You'll do even, even better if you assign likelihoods to each of these risks and prioritize defending against them accordingly. Failovers and backups and disaster recovery plans are all the products of worst case thinking and we always hope that we won't need them, but when we do, we're glad that we have them and we're glad that we took the time to think about what to do in a horrible situation. So what does all of this boil down to when it comes to web app security? So it's a tricky space, and those of you that are tasked with defending your apps have an extra hard job of trying to anticipate the work of attackers. Luckily for you, you are at a security conference. And because I have the honor of speaking last today, you've probably already heard the sage advice of all the other PurpleCon speakers, and you're ready to go and think good and hard about it over dinner. So here are the top four wizarding security tips that I have for you today. Threat modeling is really handy for anticipating what an attacker might try to do to you and countering against it. Think about who's likely to attack you, what they're likely to try doing, and how you might stop them. Then build those things and refine them as you learn more. Defense in depth also helps your app stay secure. Just remember that to make sure that your your app is using different kinds of layers of defenses over one another, and that all your defenses are independently robust, and that they build on each other's strengths. Especially make sure that you review your defenses regularly and keep them up to date. Have a disaster recovery plan. Things are going to go bad, and it helps to have thought about what you're going to do in those cases, and to have practiced for it. 
Insecurity, thinking about the worst case scenario, is our strength. So make sure that you use it to your advantage. Plan for the absolute worst. Finally, stay on top of the very basic things that let dark wizards pass your defenses. Patch your software, patch your dependencies, test for the OWASP top 10 on a regular basis. And remember that you need to keep doing this often because things can get out of date quickly and dark wizards never rest. That's it for today's Devs Against the Dark Arts class. I want to thank you all for coming to my talk and for making PurpleCon awesome. And if you take one thing out of this, just remember to think like Voldemort when you're defending your apps. Have a great evening. <laughs>